Good day, this is Peter Quidis. I'm the medical director of the Mary M. Gooley Hemophilia Center in Rochester, New York. And it's my pleasure to give, present you on a bleeding disorder condition, namely platelet function disorders, and basically cover the various uh, issues that can arise from birth uh, to adulthood in someone who has a platelet disorder, specifically a disorder of the function of the uh, platelets. I'd like to apologize in advance that I'm gonna be unavailable to have the live question and answer session uh, for this, uh, because unfortunately we had planned ahead our time in the mountains, and uh, thankfully we don't have good Wi-Fi access there uh, in that sense, but I'm happy to uh, take uh, any questions by email. My email is down there. If you wanna jot it down, I'll give you a few more seconds. But I do understand that my uh, dear colleague from the University of Michigan, uh, Jim Munn, is going to do a live uh, session uh, for questions and answers. So I uh, entrust Jim will do a great job. But in case you had some follow-up questions regarding my slides or a specific uh, issue regarding your situation, you're welcome to use that uh, email. Besides sharing you my email, I have to share my disclosures. And I have some major disclosures. The first one is uh, being Greek. Believe it or not, I never owned a restaurant, nor did my father, but my grandfather did. At one point in America, one out of five uh, restaurants were uh, owned by uh, Greeks. Um, living in Rochester, the nearest NFL uh, uh, team, for better or for worse, is Buffalo. I don't know if we have any Buffalo Bills fans. Seems um, we have more New England uh, uh, Patriots fans and they just don't like us. The feeling is mutual. Uh, but as far as uh, other passions of sports, uh, I'm a doer. I like to participate in my greatest sport is cycling. So uh, between April to October, that's our season here in Rochester in terms of the weather, I usually ride to work and I'll be leaving in a little bit doing that. Um, and then uh, one of my other uh, hobbies is going to uh, camp, uh, hemophilia camp, where we have a wonderful time uh, uh, with uh, the participants, uh, having uh, uh, many opportunities to educate and also uh, to help our patients uh, be empowered and learn how to do their own infusions and other treatments. But uh, again, uh, in terms of any specific uh, disclosures, uh, seriously speaking, in that sense, I really don't have any uh, uh, specific uh, disclosures, any uh, conflicts of interest with pharmaceutical companies. In the next slide, I just want to, uh, again, uh, go back to being Greek and uh, the fact that uh, um, I'm very proud that uh, two thirds of the medical terms are from the Greek. And uh, I'm also uh, uh, hardwired, so to speak, to uh, teach by asking questions. So some of the questions, some of the topics, uh, some of the slides I'm going to share with you are going to start with a question. So here's our first question. What in the world do platelets have to do with bleeding? And uh, the answer is uh, buried somewhere in this slide. I love to show this slide because I can tell how many of the medical students when I give this lecture are nerds. You think they need to copy down every single uh, piece of information here as if they don't, as if they don't do that, they're not going to pass the exam. So I ask them to relax and try to realize the reason why they're attending this lecture is that uh, someone hopefully knowledgeable, like myself hopefully, can uh, simplify this, can uh, break it down into two steps. And the reason why we don't bleed is because we have two steps that, that are involved in clotting, to stop bleeding. So clot is the consequence of the body responding to an injury where the blood is spurting out and it tries to stop that bleeding by forming a clot. And making that clot requires two steps. The first step is the platelets. They are very important to come together. Platelets are kind of like marbles. If you put a bunch of marbles in your hand, you can't get them to stick. So to get them to stick, you need this clotting factor called von Willebrand's. It's like super glue, but that's not enough. Once you get the clump of platelets stuck together with the super glue, the blood can still try to escape between the little cracks of those marbles. So if we use that analogy of the marbles, the second step is to put a bag around the marbles. If you tell a kid, pick up your marbles, you're asking them to find a bag usually to put the marbles in. And that bag is made up of a clotting protein here called fibrin. Fibrin is the final product based on a series of uh, actions of clotting factors that generate fibrin. 
And uh, that will, that's the second step. So then stands the reason that you could lead if you have a problem in step one, either a deficiency of von Willebrand's factor or maybe a deficiency of the platelets. So in this case, if you're not born with enough platelets or they don't work well, decreased function, that's gonna to lead to bleeding. Just as an aside, hemophilia involves a second step where you have a deficiency of these binding factors, specifically eight or nine, but you could have the other ones also. A little bit more about platelets, there are these little uh, uh, globular cells right here, that's a platelet. And see how they're coming together to clump? We'd like to see that, that's gonna block the blood. And uh, platelets are produced within your bones in the blood that produces, uh, in the, the marrow that produces your blood, your bone marrow. And the cells that produce the platelets are called megakaryocytes, megakaryocytes. This is a megakaryocyte. And it produces uh, these uh, small little cells, these platelets, about one to three million platelets. And uh, they last for about 10 days. Platelets, again, are your first line of defense when you cut yourself. Normally, you don't cut yourself because the blood is confined between the two sides here of the blood vessel wall. You only cut yourself if there's an injury. Otherwise, the blood is minding its own business. See the cells are waved goodbye to the platelets and the white cells and the red cells. They're kind of minding their own business there. So those are, uh, those are the platelets and the red cells and the, um, uh, the white cells there. But then all of a sudden, life happens. You may have a wisdom tooth removed, or you may fall off your bicycle, or in the case of a female, you may uh, give birth, or uh, once a month have a heavy period. The blood is then gonna escape. So now it's serious. The blood is escaping. Stop that red cell. Let's try to stop it. Let's block that red cell right there. So the way we do that is that two-step process to plug up the opening here. So the first step is there is this matrix under here called collagen that then pops up. And the collagen will then engage with this clotting protein I mentioned called von Willebrand's factor, this purple protein here that binds to the collagen. And at the other end, it starts binding to the platelets. So now the platelets come and they bind through a clotting receptor called glycoprotein 1B. There's a very severe uh, platelet disorder we will mention called bernard Soulier, where you don't have enough of this glycoprotein 1B, so you can't clump the platelets together. Once they clump, they become activated. And as they become activated, they then uh, elicit other uh, platelets that come together, and then all of a sudden you have this nice, beautiful clump of platelets. Now that, as I said, is not enough. The body needs to put a bag around the platelets, and it generates that through these clotting factors, factor eight and factor 10. And then uh, by doing that, this pink uh, uh, covering is going to go around the platelets and you end up with this nice bag. So normally in life, what happens is you have an injury, the blood, the red cells escape, and then all of a sudden the body gets activated and you can make this nice plug. You can stop the, the blood from escaping with the help of these little cells, these little uh, gray cells here, the platelets, as well as this fibrin that wraps around it. And this is this yellow uh, material is the fibrin. The next graphic kind of reminds you to keep it simple, uh, there's only five ways someone could bleed. They could either bleed because they don't have enough platelets, low platelets, or uh, the focus of today's talk is that the platelets don't function well or they could bleed because they don't have enough von Willebrands or they can't make the clot or they uh, have a tendency to break down the clot. But our focus today will be the second cause of uh, bleeding, decreased platelet function. Platelets make a clot, the clot's called a thrombus. So a platelet's called a thrombocyte. If you have low platelets, which is usually not the case with uh, these disorders I'm gonna discuss, uh, that's called thrombocytopenia or thrombocytopenic bleeding. Or in the case of a platelet function disorder, as is the focus of uh, this uh, uh, session, that's called a thrombocytopathy. Thrombocytopathy. So that's that type of bleeding. And again, it all goes back to the first step of making a clot, that if you don't have enough functional platelets, you could bleed. Whereas in hemophilia, it involves the second step. 
Now we mentioned that you could also have low platelets, but by and large, people who have platelet function disorders, their main issue is that the platelets don't work well. They have enough, though as I said, in Bernard Soulier, they may be in the 80 to 100,000 range, but they just don't work well. It's a qualitative disorder. And it's involving one of the many parts of the platelet uh, structure in this next diagram here, in terms of you could bleed either because you have a deficiency in one of the receptors, that would be Bernard Soulier, or in a problem in aggregation that's called glands bins, or any of these other uh, disorders here. And we can kind of break this very busy slide into the major serious severe bleeding disorders. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I lost the graphic on it. The severe disorders are the Bernard Soulier or the thrombastenia. And then the minor ones include these receptor defects and these other disorders uh, here. And these conditions are usually inherited from both parents being carriers. Mom and dad usually don't bleed, they're carriers. And um, uh, then there's a 25% chance they could have a child that receives the carrier uh, 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 genetic change. And then that means they have their double carrier and they could bleed in that regard. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, a good example is this patient of mine who was playing football and got speared with a helmet. Uh, uh, I learned uh, later it was from his brother. A bad brother, he spared in his uh, side there. He had a very large uh, bleed there. We would call that a hematoma. When we evaluated him, we asked him about bleeding in the past, and you know, he matter of factly said, "Oh yeah, doc, I would get bruises. I get nosebleeds." Uh, he was still young enough where he did not have any dental surgery. Yet. He didn't have his wisdom teeth out. We always ask about aspirin because that can also cause a uh, platelet uh, dysfunction, and he wasn't on any aspirin. And uh, as expected, uh, neither parents uh, had any bleeding. They were probably silent periods. But his sister, who then became my patient, also had this condition. She had heavy periods. And he had the hematoma, which was getting uh, smaller when we examined him. Back then, the first test we would do is called the bleeding time test, where Marianne on the right would make a little incision on his skin and then take that filter paper and dab it on his skin and uh, dab it and then wait, uh, you know, 30 seconds, dab it again, 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 again. And over time, the bleeding stopped. And so it was called the bleeding time. And his bleeding time, uh, you can see, in, you know, in this uh, slide, oh, I thought I had it, oh, in the next slide was, uh, was more than uh, 10 minutes. Nowadays, we have a more accurate test where we don't have to make a little cut on their skin and use filter paper in the bleeding time. But rather, we see how long it takes to close the aperture of a uh, tubing called the closure time. So that's called the platelet function screen, or this test here, the closure time. And basically, we take your blood and we put it through this machine after we draw it. And then we count how long it takes to close the uh, end of the tube there. That's called closure time. And that uh, machine is called the uh, platelet function analyzer. And it was the first version, I think, so it's called 100. And it basically closes uh, the, uh, the capillary bed right here. And the machine can uh, see how long it takes. Before we had that available, my patient uh, had the bleeding time. And you can see that it was prolonged, normal is two to nine minutes. So to confirm that this was a platelet function disorder, the next test your doctor should do is a platelet aggregation study. And we also, at the same time, do a release with it. So I asked your doctor, what was the results of my platelet aggregation study? So basically you take the patient's uh, uh, platelets and we put them in a tube, we, do, we suspend them and we pass light to it. And usually the light can get through the platelets. But if you start uh, getting aggregation, uh, more light goes through there. It's less cloudy. And then that will correspond to aggregation. So we can see that in this diagram here that when you, uh, you activate the platelets, uh, they start to clump and more, more light goes through here, more light transmission. And there's two waves, the first wave and then the second wave. And we use uh, various substances in the lab to uh, stimulate the platelets in that regard. So here are some tracings. And um, if you don't have any aggregation at all with a the number of them, that could be a condition called Glansman's. 
Um, in this patient's case, there was a partial um, you know, release in that regard, um, partial aggregation, and uh, it fit what we call storage pool disorder. And the major ones are Bernard Soulier and Glanzmann's, and then the least, the less, less severe would be a storage pool disorder or secretion defect. And uh, so his study showed a delay in aggregation, and it was consistent uh, with a uh, uh, inability to have enough uh, constituents within the uh, platelets in the storage pool. And so specifically, he had a dense granular, uh, granular deficiency. It's a relatively mild bleeding disorder. And that's depicted here in this table. The more severe conditions, those of you who have Bernard Soulier or Glanzmann's, uh, unfortunately, you probably experience a lot of major bleeding, getting your nose packed, heavy periods where maybe uh, you needed an intervention for that, such as renal IUD, or possibly joint bleeding or bleeding into the brain after you know falling off one's bike, for example, or bleeding at uh, childbirth and needing blood transfusion. Whereas the less common, the less uh, severe disorders, which are, however, more common, like dense granular deficiency, other storage pool disorders, or secretion defects, these are types of uh, bleeding you can see. These bleeding symptoms occur not all at once, thankfully, but they occur in relation to one's life cycle. So in childhood, you may first notice bleeding at the time of circumcision or when the stump falls off and then uh, nosebleeds more than uh, you know, five a year for more than 10 minutes at a time. You can also see it during uh, adolescence, particularly in females when their periods start, or uh, when they're, uh, uh, they learn to you know, brush and floss their teeth. And so after they have a wisdom tooth removed, they could uh, bleed in uh, that regard. And they could also develop large hematomas. Bleeding could also occur in adulthood. And uh, these are some of the challenges in adulthood in terms of childbirth, menstruation, and they could continue to have nosebleeds and bleeding from cuts and hematomas in that regard. I next want to uh, just uh, uh, drill down a little bit into the bleeding symptoms. In terms of bruising, uh, the bruises uh, often appear out of the blue, what we call atraumatic, but they could occur when you hit yourself. That's why more commonly they occur in the lower extremities. And they could occur anywhere from once a week to once a month. And usually they're about the size of a quarter or uh, slightly larger in that sense. Nosebleed in general is equal opportunity. It could be from either a nostril, either a nares. If it's from one nostril all the time, we will then want the NT to take a look because maybe coincidentally they have a, a blood vessel uh, uh, growth called the uh, telangiotasia that uh, could be a leading, uh, you know, bleeding point, what we call an AVM, arterial venous. Uh, malformation. And then uh, the nose bleeding often again doesn't occur in a vacuum. One could either have, you know, had a baseball hit their nose or uh, high blood pressure can contribute or in the winter uh, dryness. That's why if you're listening to this and you get nosebleeds, you should have a uh, saline spray and religiously have it at your nightstand and spray your nostrils, um, you know, before you um, uh, you know, go to bed to keep it uh, nice and moist so it doesn't dry up and you bleed. You should also be aware that with flossing, one could bleed more so if they don't floss, which is a vicious cycle. Some patients won't floss because they bleed. If they don't floss, they get more gingivitis that in turn causes bleeding. So it's often a rabbit hole that we, uh, you know, dig into, uh, go down into. Uh, and often, uh, if precautions aren't taken when the wisdom teeth are removed, uh, they could bleed excessively in that sense. And when they call the oral surgeon after their tooth was removed and they're bleeding, they'll ask you to first try a tea bag. And that's completely kosher because a tea bag is not that you're in uh, Britain and you need to have tea, it's tea time, but it's because the tannins within the tea bag can help simulate clotting. So it's often worth you know, trying that. If you're a female, you certainly could have very heavy periods where you're changing under two hours. And uh, you may go through both an absorbent pad and a tampon all at once, sometimes using an absorbent uh, brand. Uh, and uh, this is one patient of mine uh, who had a bleeding disorder. And look at how many tampons and pads she went through in just one week. And we were collecting them for a research study, but thankfully the patient doesn't need to collect all their tampons and pads. What they can do is keep track of this uh, chart here, the coral blood assessment chart or the PBAC, 
And then the first day, if they go through uh, four, you know, five pads of whom four are heavy and one is mild, they just make little marks there. Then we have a scoring system and come up with a score of, you know, usually over 100 if you have heavy periods. And usually if you have heavy periods, you're losing blood, so you lose iron, you're low on iron. That's often another risk factor. And then certainly if you have a bleeding tendency like a platelet disorder, you could certainly bleed at the time of childbirth, as in uh, this diagram here of the patient having extensive bleeding so bad they needed to give uh, uh, transfusions of uh, red cells there. When you uh, have a severe platelet disorder like Glanzmann's or Bernard Soyer, you really have uh, double trouble, double jeopardy in that regard. You can have both heavy periods as well as uh, postpartum uh, hemorrhage in that sense. Postpartum hemorrhage is what gives me my gray hairs because that could be potentially life-threatening and also a risk to the baby. In order to ensure a good uh, outcome when you're pregnant, uh, we really need to work together. You don't want to see little old me alone. You want to see me with my obstetrician, me with my nurse, uh, me with my laboratory expert, the whole team. So we can do best we can both to control the periods before delivery, uh, before you're pregnant, antepartum, and then prevent bleeding at the time of delivery. So those are the things we want you, you know, to keep in mind. We also want you to know if you're going to have surgery, so we can take precautions to prevent uh, bleeding and oozing and uh, hematomas uh, in that regard. And also, if you bump your, uh, you know, thigh against the coffee table and end up with a large Bruce, please contact us so again uh, we can take precautions. And again, if your brother whacks you with a wiffle bat in your mouth, uh, please call us or a nosebleed. If it's a dental procedure, please call us and we'll remind you about these following parts of a dental procedure. All dental procedures are not created equal. Some are just cleaning, where you really don't have to do much unless you have poor hygiene, or if they're removing a tooth or a or nerve block. Uh, then, you know, um, uh, we want to take precautions. And, it, and the type of precaution we take depends on how severe is the platelet disorder. We may need to give a clotting factor called 7A. Uh, and if you're really bleeding out, we may need to give a platelet transfusion. We usually use a medication called Amicar, uh, you know, to uh, prevent bleeding. If that's not available, I say that. Amicar is available as a syrup, but it's very expensive. It's about $1,000. It's that expensive. Uh, so if the insurance doesn't cover it, uh, we could use, uh, you know, uh, this Lysteta that stabilizes the blood clots, two pills orally, three times a day. Other forms of contraception are permissible. Uh, um, and I'm sorry, I, um, I didn't uh, uh, advance my slide. I'm talking about heavy periods. Other forms of contraception are permissible besides uh, the Marina IUD. Uh, is an option in the Norplan, I, uh, Norplan device under the skin. Uh, and there's several hormone uh, uh, preparations. If those don't seem to help, we can add uh, this uh, blood uh, product, to this, uh, this compound to stabilize uh, the clot called Lysate. So we could do that. And then in terms of uh, uh, reading a childbirth, uh, we would give this uh, chronic factor 7A, and if there is still bleeding, uh, give a, a transfusion of platelets. We'd like to avoid the platelets because that could stimulate your immune system and you could become resistant to them in the future. And then after delivery, we'd like to give the intravenous form of transamic acid in that regard. These are some of the things we could do. Uh, certainly consider a platelet transfusion, you know, in that regard. And uh, again, in general, we only use the platelets kind of as last resort because there's about a 10 to 40% chance that your immune system could become uh, uh, resistant to the platelets and chew it up. So that is typically, you know, our advisement uh, to try to avoid the platelet transfusion. Certainly recombinant 7A uh, could be given. And that would also imply to, uh, you know, uh, menstrual bleeding in that regard. So only the severe disorders that Bernersi and Glansman's often need platelets. Occasionally with the milder ones, if there's major surgery, we will get a trace of the platelets. We're less worried in that sense, uh, you know, about uh, bleeding. Then finally, as I mentioned, I've learned a lot uh, through, uh, you know, my patients. 
And uh, these are some of my patients. They gave me permission to use their picture, so don't worry, don't uh, refer me to the federal government. I didn't break any HIPAA laws, and I really want to thank them. They're a great inspiration uh, for me. Um, so that was really the gist of my presentation. I wanted to first give you some background that uh, platelets are a very important key to stopping bleeding. If you don't have platelets, you're going to bleed out. Thankfully, you all have platelets. However, your platelets don't always work well. So you may make enough platelets, but the function of your platelets uh, is often suboptimal. So if you have decreased function, whether it's severe like Bernard Soulier or Glanzmann's or mild like a platelet uh, storage pool disorder or secretion defect, then you know there's still a number of things we could do, just like we would for severe platelet disorder in terms of, you know, uh, if one is really bleeding out, we'll give a platelet transfusion. But uh, uh, again, as I said, we would like to avoid that in general. So uh, we often would try a medication, as I mentioned, to stabilize the clots, prevent your body from lysing it, what we call a fibrinolytic uh, agent, uh, either amacar or tranexamic acid. And then for major bleeding, we would give you a platelet uh, transfusion. Sometimes there's another drug we use called DDABP that's very effective for von Willebrand, which is a mild platelet disorder, uh, uh, bleeding disorder in general. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it doesn't work as well for a platelet disorder, maybe about, um, you know, uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent, uh, you know, uh, efficacy uh, in that regard. But sometimes we'll use it. It may help some forms of landsmen in that uh, regard. It doesn't work as well for Bernard Soulier. So uh, that is really my presentation, and I hope uh, you gained a lot from it. Um, I'm sorry uh, one size doesn't fit all because platelets are a very broad range of disorders from severe conditions like Bernard Soulier or Glantons to mild platelet function disorders, which I should also add that often uh, they're quite mild, but if someone really bleeds a lot, they may also have other platelet, other uh, blood disorders like von Willebrand's. So often they need to be uh, tested, uh, you know, in that regard. So again, uh, I'm available for questions by email. My email again is peter.kouides at rochesterregional.org. It's all one word, Rochester Regional. And uh, if you could just kindly fill out the uh, evaluation so we could do better. And um, again, uh, I'm uh, willing to link up with any of you if there's questions. Again, I thank you for your time and uh, hope you have a good rest of the summer. Thank you.